Oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in to Snow the Goalie, the only Flyers podcast, the People's podcast, the Players podcast, Prognosticators podcast, PD Light podcast, Papers podcast. We, we have a loaded show today, and there, there are a bunch of different topics going on, a bunch of things on and off the ice that we need to get into today. Um, before we do, I want to get to the, the most handsome guy on the show, and that's Bundy. Look at this man in all black. Looks like he's about to go, you know, take down James Bond himself. How are you doing, Bundy? And uh, and are you excited to talk to Flyers? <laughs> James Fond. <laughs> it's not Fond. Uh, we used to get the imitation Hugo Boss, and we call it the Hugo Ross. <laughs> it wasn't the same. Just <laughs> not the same. I'm doing. I'm doing great, guys. Um, what a what a couple of weeks uh, it's been, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's good. I mean the team's got. Uh, you know, coming off Minnesota last night, off to Winnipeg tomorrow, and then um, and then they got a week off before the All Star festivities. But yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Kind of like you know, getting right back into the hockey part of it. You know, a little bit about um, you know, we're we're exactly you know when you get to overtime, right? Now we're just, you know, Anthony knows this, Russ, you do too. You know, a lot of the warts really become exposed because you really keep those games tight, right? Like the like Torch is a master of taking a team that's very me- mo- mediocre, moderate, and finding them a way to stay in the game for 60 minutes, which is what what's good for a team like this. That's why the torch move was a good signing because he keeps, he'll, he'll keep the team engaged long enough to keep the fans interested. But when you get into those overtime situations, you can really see where it falls off as you get into more skill. The problem, I guess we'll just get jump right into it in the game last night. Like that was a winnable game, a bad team. Any bad team was ready to beat Minnesota last night um, because they were, weren't ready to go. And the Flyers had a chance to steal a win. Problem is, is that, you know, they have just enough skill to hang around and enough skill to finish the game off last night where you know, they get connect the position, not his fault, position in a defensive role. He gets turn styled and uh, in the game ends. But that that kind of shows a discrepancy when you get to the three on three and the skill level, even the game before that, where, you, you know, the two on one doesn't happen. Everybody's crying for a penalty in Philadelphia at the end of the play. I don't, I still don't know why Rue's whining about it. Things happen in the game. And then uh, they, they come back down the uh, Winnipeg, was it Winnipeg? No, LA comes back down the other way. Um, and they, they score the goal to win it in overtime. And that's kind of the way it goes. But um, Flyers are doing just enough to make it interesting right now. And it's kind of like how we said it would play itself out. Um, and coming off the week that they just had, I mean, it was a pretty polarizing week in Flyerland. And it's good to just get back to get, get back to hockey talk. And, um, you know, an interesting thought before I hand it off to Anthony, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk around the league, guys. And um, I'd like to talk about this in the show. Uh, you know, Vancouver, I, I was listening to you know, Rick, my old teammate, Rick Talk, gets the head coaching uh, job there after what was really a disaster organizationally for the Canucks, the way that Jimmy Rutherford handled it and, and their entire staff was just pathetic. Uh, it made, you know, it, it t- took the humanity out of, of the way people are supposed to be treated in their job. But interestingly enough, not talking about necessarily coaching change, but the player personnel. Vancouver's a, kind of a similar team to the Flyers. That They have some guys. They got a couple guys that are much more high-end, like Quinn Hughes. Whether or not, I don't know what he'll turn out to be long-term. If he's going to be, you know, a complete winner defenseman like Scott Niedemeyer remains to be seen. But they have a couple pieces. And then Pedersen. But the rest of the guys they're talking about are all movable parts. Like Bo Horvat, uh, uh, you know, talking about Tyler Myers moving that contract. And I just had come through an article. This is what the Flyers need to start doing. And Anthony had touched upon it, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you, you're going to have to move guys that maybe you think are good on this team for you to be better. And it might like, and for what I'm saying to you right now on this roster, as it sits, because I know there's a ceiling, you got a floor, you got to meet. I don't have one single untouchable. Like Vancouver, you know, what I'm saying Anthony might have two untouchables. Yeah, I don't know if the Flyers have an untouchable. I don't, and I'm not. I, I've seen enough to probably say no, and I'll leave it at that. That's how I want to open up today, guys. There's a myriad of hockey talk that I'm looking forward to discussing this week. Because the trade deadline's coming, and if Chuck's not already talking to other teams about all these valuable parts that he thinks he has or things that other teams need for their playoff run, then he may be behind the eight ball already because these discussions should have started happening well over a month ago, and I hope that they did. 
Well, Bundy, I mean, in fairness, he's he's getting ready to buy, not sell, because it's Chuck Fletcher, and the Flyers aren't that far out of playoff. I know you're being sarcastic, though. No, there's no... I don't even know if I am. There's no way I genuinely... I genuinely don't know if I'm even being sarcastic at this point, because this, this organization continues to just pacify him and continues to allow him to drive this team in the opposite direction of where they should. And to your point, by the way, about Vancouver, the difference between the Vancouver and, and Philadelphia is eight points. Eight points that it's going to be hard for Philadelphia to make up in the negative in order to uh, to get a better position for the draft. Uh, but, but that's what I'm saying. That's where, if Tortorella had the Vancouver Canucks right now, they would be eight points ahead of the players. Exactly. Yep. Okay, you tell that's exactly what there's no I have no absolutely zero doubt about that. Uh, so there's a lot of hockey talk going on, but I'm just saying that these are the these are the forward thinking things they should be thinking about. Because like this this needs a flip, man. This needs a whole turn. And and I don't want to get like we talked about like oh so you know, I keep going on here and so oh we're five points up. Stop. Stop with the wild card whatever getting it eighth and all that and i think you really do realize what a detriment it is to finish between 17th and 25th and in, in, in the nhl final standings it's a disaster and that's exactly where this team's gonna fit and that's where vancouver's problem is too they're not into the bottom five yet either and that's why you got to start with it and go back to what anthony said again if you want to have a shitty team just meet the floor and fill it with American leaguers. Yep. And that's how you, that's, that's, there's no tanking. And you can't tank with players on the ice. But if you want to have a minimized roster that's going to lose a lot and get you into that situation, there's been a lot of talk about tanking on Twitter lately from a lot of different teams. You read it and, and see, because all these, you know, these guys, and I hate that. I hate lining yourself up for a pick that may or may not be great, you know, and, 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 and what time will tell. Apparently this year there's four really good picks, but you know that's how you do it. Uh, you you just take a, a roster that's not as not as good, and that's how you end up going down the toilet pretty quick late. Uh, but the Flyers have some work to do because they cannot go in the next season or the off season with the full semblance of what this team looks like right now, or you're going to have yeah. the same perfume with the same, you know, say Billy Goat with the same perfume on it next year. Same thing. The hell of an analogy. Is that a uh... Is that like an Ottawa thing? Putting perfume on a Billy Goat? Is that putting lipstick on a pig? Perfume <laughs> lipstick on a pig is fine. You know, it's all the same yeah, stuff. Bro. Perfume on a Billy Goat, I've never heard before. All right. Now we're gonna get to the guy who already has caused um I don't know, half the audience to be ready to tune out because of the background noise. That of course is a man who couldn't be bothered to sit at his desk to record with us today. <laughs> the man who is driving currently and thought that that's an acceptable place to record an episode, so uh, I will say this in advance. We'll do our best to clean up the audio on this episode. I'm trying to mute him in between him talking and not, but we'll see how it goes. And of course, is Anthony San Filippo, who you can find on Twitter, at Ann San Philly. How are you doing? Actually, I know. Are you excited to talk to the Flyers hockey? You, you know, Russ, when Bundy drives in the car to do a show, he's driving, you know, I think he was driving to see his daughter play basketball like four hours away. We had no problem with that. No, no mention of it. No, no, you know, there's Bundy and he's just talking and it's all cool. But because it's me, okay, which by the way, we were scheduled to record originally two hours later. Okay. Now it gets changed last minute and I happen to be on the road and now I get shit for it. But I just let, I'll let that slide. I'm doing, I mean, Bundy's Bundy though. Bundy's, I have, I want to have Anthony's back on this. I do. I got it. It's, listen. Uh, when you're working Ross and he's, you're trying to grind it out a little bit like he's doing, and and there's a lot of... Anthony, go ahead, buddy. I welcome you in the car and everything. I have your back. This is a safe place for Thanks, you to talk. Buddy, to flyers high. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, there's... I, yeah, I've written a few couple stories this week kind of like looking at things, and I mean, we're going to dive into the, the whole big uh, epic 3,000-word network article later on in the in the podcast, but just off of what Bundy was talking about, I did a post um, for today off of the game last night where uh, I'm looking at the fact that they are one and eight in overtime. And why are you, why are, is a team so bad in overtime when they're really competitive in the 60, for the most part, in a 60 minute regulation game? And it's really got to be when you're, you know, playing in that, those first 60 minutes and it's mostly five on five hockey. 
and you're able to use Tortorella's system and you get some good goaltending, you're able to hang with teams. Even if you don't have the same talent that the other team has, if you're willing to work hard and, and play within that system and be, you know, be smart about it, you can be in games and you have a shot at winning some games. Um, but once you get into that overtime and it's three on three, that's where the, the real gap in high end skill talent and not having high end skill talent shows. And the Flyers are one in eight in overtime. And even, even worse than that, Russ, and this is, this is, this kind of goes along with Bundy's point about being where they are now is the worst place to possibly be right between 17 and 25. The, the reason that it's so bad, if you look at the Flyers schedule so far, they play 50 games. Of those 50 games, the 27, they've played 27 of them against teams that are currently sitting in a playoff spot. Of those 27 games, they've lost 20. They've lost 20 of 27 <laughs> against playoff teams. So, like, wh- where is that? So, they are in that game. So, they have a winning record against non-playoff teams, but they get obliterated by playoff teams. So, they are right smack dab where you do not want to be. And, oh, by the way, They've been here, maybe not last year. Last year was a shit year. But they've been here for most of the past decade, with the exception of the, of the um, I would say, the the uh, pandemic year that was split up and they went into the bubble. You know, they won a playoff round that year. It was the one year where they were probably in a much better spot. But aside from that, every other year since the year they beat Pittsburgh in the first round and Claude Giroux and the shift and everything else, 2012, Every year since then, this is exactly where they've been, and it's not a good spot to be. So this all comes back to, and I, I know that sometimes it feels like we're recycling talking points, but like it, 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 it once again needs to be said. There have been teams over the last few years that have had varying degrees of success in this league, and some have still blown it up or have changed and, and decided to pivot. You know, you go back to that bubble year, right? Montreal has uh, a heck of a postseason, right? Like, let's not forget, Montreal, after making a Stanley Cup final, turns around and blows it up because they realize they weren't as good as maybe some pundits thought they were, and they realize that the long-term future of the team wasn't maybe as optimistic as it should have been. So they kind of pulled the plug on something that, if we're being honest here, if the Flyers had done that, if they had gone on that kind of run and then decided to blow it up, there probably would be some people who'd be upset in this town. But, like... You, you have to be willing to do what's best for your team. And, and to your point, Ant, this team has not done that for quite some time. It doesn't matter who the general manager is. Uh, they, they seem to just continue to be on the path into a brick wall, like we talked about last week, where you can either kind of bottom out or at least go with some sort of rebuild or really do the aggressive retool, go out, acquire a star player in free agency, move salary if it requires it, and try to be competitive. They continue to just kind of, they, they, they try to have it both ways and neither way works. And the, the problem, and, and I know Bundy, you know, you said off the top, you know, stop joking about, um, about Fletcher being a buyer at the deadline. But like the fact remains, this team isn't so far out of it that he can't tell himself that there's a, a chance to actually compete here. Like, I do think that Chuck Fletcher is delusional enough to think that there is a shot here at making the postseason and that they're only a couple of pieces away. I'd go so far as to say that if the Flyers remain in relative contention, and I know that that's a tricky spot to be in, if they pull to within, say, five points, seven points of a playoff spot, Chuck Fletcher, who has not met with the media, will come out at some point and say, well, you know what? We like our team, and we think that if we had had Sean Couturier this entire season, and if we had had Cam Atkinson, think about how much better we would be. And it's all nonsense. The whole concept is nonsense. And at some point, one of two things has to happen. Either this GM slash president of Hockey Ops needs to have a moment of honesty with himself, and needs to realize that that is not the reality that we all live in, or this ownership group needs to remove him from his post because we've seen what the Chuck Fletcher-led organization looks like, and it's mediocre at best. In fact, in most cases, it's exponentially worse than what I think anybody would want to see. So, Bundy, l- let me throw this back to you. In, in the case of where the Flyers are right now, 
where we saw them coming into the season and where they're at now, how much different has this looked to you versus what you thought and what we as a group thought going into the season? Are you surprised by where they are at in terms of top end talent and the results that they're getting for this coach? Well, I knew the coach would do a good job. I actually think they probably have four or five more wins than they probably are are worthy of having because of the coach. At this point, 50 games, absolutely they have four or five wins because of him. Um, so that's that in and of itself, you can kind of get like some smoke and mirrors involved with it. Yeah. They're, I mean, I don't think anybody, if, if you're a hockey guy, like if someone said, hey, come on in here and tell us what you think. I mean, they don't have to because they could listen to this show. And I, I think we, we were very honest about it. You know, I mean, I care deeply about this franchise and about the seasons this team has because I know what it means to this city. I know what it means to the fans. You don't know, have a good hockey team. Um, but there, this is not a team. Like, I'm not going to have somebody now come and tell me next year, oh, Couturier's back. You cannot sell me on having a guy who just missed two years of hockey. But if he even comes back this year at all to come back and be the savior, there's no way. He's played enough hockey in, in the NHL as is where, you know, he's going to have injuries. Same with Atkinson. Same with the other guy. If, if, I even forgot his name. Uh, the defenseman. Ellis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty Don't worry. Don't he's worry. Looks- Nobody really remembers who he is either, except to uh, to kind of dunk on the move itself. So there's, there's but you've got, they've got to go in and, and they've got to reevaluate the moves they've made, the, the, the players that are worth keeping, which to be honest with you, I think Torts is going to have a pretty big say in that, Russ. Uh, in terms of where, you know, he's going to, I think, I think it's important for him to voice, whether he's right or wrong, he, somebody else needs to go in there with a high, with a high frequency, high pitched voice and say, this is what we need. And here's the, here's what I would do, or here's what I would be looking at doing, or here's what I need, uh, to make my team better. They need a number one defenseman. That's not going to fall off a tree. Um, you could probably, I don't even know how you could pry one because every team's looking for one and the teams that have them, they're not giving one up. Um, this is not 1995 where <laughs> you're going to be able to get like a John LeClaire and Eric Desjardins for, uh, you know, an, uh, like a, a superstar Mark, Mark Recchi. But again, those are the kind of trades though you might have to start looking for. If you can get like trading a guy who's had a great year, uh, du- like also part of dumping salary, but these conversations have to be going on right now. And, and again, it sure looks like, you know, Chuck's pretty locked in there as a GM. You know, I can't say anything else about it. I don't, when I talk about hockey, I talk about what I see nightly, you know, and I, and I don't, I try to avoid, um, the rumors or the things that you'd hear about who's coming or going. Uh, we've talked before. I think this team needed an overhaul, uh, in the hockey department. And that starts at the, at the, the top of, of where the GM, there's been enough time here, you know, it's been enough time here to have a look and to the plug and play pieces out. I mean, and obviously Chuck didn't uh, draft Nolan Patrick, you, you know, he didn't run up with a bust to the number two pick. Uh, but those things do happen. They happen to other teams. There's a lot of guys that have had players that were picked in the top 10 that are not panning out for their teams. You know, it's harder when you say top five, but this, this needs a full evaluation. We've said it, but it also re- deserves complete honesty. You know, like somebody has got to really in there in that room say, Hey guys, you know, I don't know if we're sitting around stroking each other, but this ain't working. This is not a stroking the egos. Yeah. I, whether it's like, egos or whatever, you know, whatever it is. But I mean, to be in sports, you can have an ego and you got to have thick skin, man. If you're running that job, I mean, you almost have to be a bit of an asshole in a, in a lot of ways to just be able to absorb what people say or, or what your beliefs and your convictions are. But, you know, last off season was not a good off season. You know, these are things. And, and and now the other part about it is, too, you wonder, you know, you can say what you want about Johnny Gaudreau, uh, you know, coming here last summer. I didn't want him to come here. It's nice that he wanted, but I didn't think I would ever be a budding part for your future. Yeah, you get people the first half year, and then after the team was the same product with the, the kind of numbers with a guy like that of the team, the fans still revolt against him. They say it's a bad move. I actually think it was a good move not bringing him in here. Um, but that's my opinion. I think there's better pieces down the road that you can plug in place and, uh, and and figure that out. But this is a this is a lot of work, Russ. That's involved in running a team, and you got to have a good vision, and you got to have an honest vision about you know what your team is, you know. And and you can't go around. I don't. I do not, and I will not allow this guy or anybody in the hockey side to say we're just a few points out of the wild card spot. I don't want to hear it. It's yeah, hard, and, and it's it's uncalled for. This. 
has been listen we've had a good year on here because we've been we've been more positive the team the, the things i echoed last year was the lack of effort the garbage we saw every single night you know guys not caring and it was apparent it was stood out to everybody and as a result the building was getting a few thousand people on it it was a, it was a disaster and a coach came out at the end of the year and said nobody could coach this team and have success with it. So you got a guy in here this year, you kind of change that. But to get to where this group needs to go, I do think that at this point, you're going to need a, a Tortorella voice to say, here's what I need moving forward. And you guys, if you're in there saying this or something with someone else, stop bullshitting yourselves and let's start being honest. We're not winning the cup next year. We're not winning the cup the year after or the year after. Unless some kind of miracle happens, but it's really hard to do in a salary cap era, Anthony. It is, and you know that too. So that's why this rebuild. Look at the Colorado Avalanche. I mean, if you ask Bill Meltzer, they had two rebuilds, which to me is putting, you know, again, more like, you know, lipstick on a pig to make it look like it was better than it was. It started in 2009, they say, and then they had to do a rebuild again in 2015. If you're going to do a rebuild, rebuild. Find the young guys that you want to salvage, and it start building around it, which you're going to have to start drafting higher. You're going to have to start actually, you're, you will. You're going to have to find a way, whether it's a trade or the assets you have, to try to go find one of the next couple drafts or a deep draft to draft somebody in the top four or five of that draft. And that's what and, being a good GM is about. It's always, always, always having your head in the, uh, it, you know, finding out what's going on, being on top of all of the things that go on around the league, whether it's rumors, whether it's active, whether it's some player discontent. You got to have people working around the league, understanding these things and knowing them on the spot and in real time. And if you don't, then it's called incompetence. But this is a job you got to be on 18 hours out of 24 a day. You get six to sleep. And if you're not, then you're behind the eight ball. The good teams, too. The other thing, too, is that in, in having good hockey people around, too. You know, I don't mind having hockey people like guys that worked here. I think it's great. Look at Steve Eisenman. Was he us talking the other day, Anthony, or Bill Meltzer? I was saying he's got all his former teammates as his scouts, right? Like guys that he played with and trusts. Like, you know, he's not afraid to have people bring voices off off, off the top of him. But this is a tough job. It's a hard job. It requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of focus. And it requires hockey knowledge. You got to know what's going on. You got to know personalities. You got to understand where the a guy's level of, of development comes into play. Is he developing? Is he not developing? Is it time to move the asset? Is it time to look for an asset? It's a tough, it's it's a full time job. And if you don't have the right people doing it, you're going to have a shitty team year after year. Why is Buffalo been bad forever? Seriously. Like, there's teams I could go around. I'm not picking up Buffalo. They've been awful forever. Like, they're never good. They were, they were in the finals in 19, what, 98 or 99. They lost, in, you know, to Dallas. But for the most part, in the 90s, they had good teams. Every year, they've been at the basement for the uh, one of the bottom dwellers of this team. Same with the Ottawa Senators. Another dumpster fire of a team. Probably shouldn't have a team in the city. I'm from Ottawa. But I'm just going to say that out loud. I know people will hate me for saying it. But one of the other reasons they have, they don't draft great. They don't have good free agents that want to go there. Oh, but GM that's all working the stages everywhere, finding out about the team. And if you don't, you're going to be left in the basement for a long time to come until you overhaul that entire department. Which actually leads us to something that Anthony wrote. And I I, I, I want to come back in a little bit, Bundy, so don't let me forget. You, you mentioned about the need to go after a, a top defenseman and about uh, deciding which players are are worth it. And, and there's one player who comes to mind that is having a great year for this team, but there is the question of whether or not it's time to sell high or does he become part of your future? I want to get there in a little bit. But before we do, Anthony wrote a story that I think has been a long time coming, and he laid it out. I Listen, in, in the course of the day, as I'm writing the stuff that I have to write for the different sites that I have to write them for, I'll occasionally get a note from Anthony that like, oh, you need to look at this post I'm about to put up. So I dove in. I'm like used to seeing like a 2,000 word Anthony post. This was a 35, I think it was 3,574 word post that Anthony put together. And it was a chronological order uh, or a chronology, I guess we'll say, of the top hockey executives in this organization over the past few decades. And it showed what, what truly is as close to as a, an incestuous group as it can be, where you have roughly six to seven different executives or former players or former coaches 
that have essentially spent the past 20 plus years scratching each other's backs. And it, and it shows you over time how you end up in the place that this team has so routinely ended up, no matter who's in charge of hockey apps or no matter who is the GM of the team, because these people are always working with each other. They're always scratching each other's backs. So, Anthony, I, I'm going to give you the floor here. I'm even going to give you the spotlight on the video for those who are watching the show for you to kind of lay this out a little bit and explain to those who might not have read it, who should, they can go over to crossroadcom and read the story. But for those who haven't read it, can you give people, you know, I, I don't know, like a, a shortened version of what the point of the post was and why the network, as you dub them, I call them a cabal, but the network, as you put them, has led this team into the place that it's been for the better part of two decades. Uh, uh, so, I, in other words, when you say short, you wanted less than 3,500 words written, right? Okay. Um <laughs> So, so w the genesis of this was was kind of um, tied into the whole Ivan Provorov situation from a couple weeks ago, and I, I don't want to relitigate that, and, and I didn't relitigate it in the story, uh, but that was the genesis for for the story, and and the reason it was the genesis was because of the um, stories that kind of came out uh, while I was away, uh, both um, Charlie O'Connor in the Athletic and Marcus Hayes in the Inquirer wrote about the fact that. Uh, Hockey Ops knew about the Provorov situation uh, a week before the game happened um, when he didn't wear the the Pride Night jersey and chose not to communicate that with business operations and with ownership. And it, it just got me thinking that, you know, would this have happened before? Like, you know, we always we always like to go to that question. Would this have happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago, like if this kind of situation cropped up, how would the team have handled it? And would it be different than what they're, what they did now? And of course my philosophy and my thought was, and I think Bundy will probably confirm when he gets to speak on this, that under Ed Snyder's time, that an internal problem like this would have been resolved internally. Um, a, a direction would have been put in place and there, it would not have become public that there was internal strife or yeah. or, um, or 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 disagreement on the subject, right? So, with that being thought, the fact that it was allowed to happen indicates poor leadership at the top, right? So, so there is no oversight. So, these kinds of things have been festering. We've been talking about how there are people within the organization who want to see others within the organization fail. But when it comes to something like this, it becomes more of hockey ops versus the world, right? So everybody on the hockey side is going to do it one way and they don't really care what the people on the other side think. Um, and that's been kind of been able, been building for the better part of a decade. Um, you know, Ed's been gone since, since uh, 2016. So when those things happen and when you when you basically have it without that oversight, when you get to a situation like this, it, it's going to become a problem. And it certainly was a problem. But the problem here really ends up being this, guys. You have a situation where um, the, the people running hockey ops feel infallible, feel like they can't do any wrong. It's their show to run and no one's going to tell them how to run it. And so when that happens, you got to look back and say, well, what what has created that? How has that kind of mentality and that kind of attitude come into play or been put in place? And that has, so I looked at it and said, okay, let's just look at the trace, the history. And if you go back to really the, the, the very beginnings of the franchise, you can find, it's like a six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but you can find the connections that go back that long and over a span of 50 years gets you to the people that are in place now. Now, this is not to knock Bob Clark or Paul Holmgren um, for the, works that, the work that they've done for this organization. They've been great uh, both on the ice and off the ice. I've fought with people many times defending the, the GM tenures of Bob Clark and Paul Holmgren, I think they both did an outstanding job. I think Clark 
was better than Holmgren, but that doesn't mean that Holmgren was bad. I think Holmgren did very well considering the situation he kind of came into, right? Came into being GM off of the worst season in franchise history in 2006, 2007. Um, and and turned it around to get to an Easter Conference Final within the within one year, so I give him a lot of a lot of credit for that. But when you get to this point, and they're not involved with with putting rosters together now, they really aren't. What you have is a situation where, as senior advisors, and that's a word that around this league ha- should be more meritorious. It should be more saying thank you for your time, and yet teams around the league use it. Uh, in, in a way to kind of um, allow people to who used to be in these positions to still have some semblance of power and control. Um, instead, it, they, they, what, it, what it has done here is you have four senior advisors, three who are former players here, and then the other being Dean Lombardi, who have Dave Scott's ear. And when it comes to major decisions, like who should be your general manager or who should be assistant general managers uh, or who should be your head coach. They are the ones who are in the owner's the ownership's ear and helping to shape those decisions. So when we get to a point right now where the entire hockey watching world thinks that Chuck Fletcher has failed by now as a general manager and he keeps the position, he's keeping it not because he's doing a good job or not because Dave Scott thinks he's doing a good job, but because the senior advisors are telling Dave Scott to give him more time. Look, it's close. Look, there's still Tortorella's done a nice job turning this around. We're only a couple players away from really being in the playoffs. And that's a problem. And that's where I think the time has come to move in a different direction. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It doesn't mean that they are that they were bad at their jobs when they had these jobs. It just means that it's gotten to a situation where the control is too much, uh, it's centralized too much with too few people, and that the level of accountability is not high enough, and there's no not enough good oversight to ensure that the jobs are being done properly, and therefore the entire franchise suffers because the team isn't very isn't very good and so that that's what it's become and that's why i wrote it um and i hope that that's how it's interpreted uh, if people want to interpret it as me you know saying ripping paul Ulmer or ripping bob clark i'm not it's that's not where i'm going at all with this it's instead really looking at the situation as it is right now and why a a general manager who has not done a good job is allowed to continue to do that job and, and, and when you have situations that arise that make the franchise look bad, like the Ivan Provorov thing did, and where the root of that problem is, and now we find it. And I, I think that's all I wanted to kind of shed light on with that story. So that's a lot. And I appreciate you doing that. And I think you shortened it to about 2,800 words uh, here <laughs> on the show today. So thank you for saving us all those other 700. But, you know, this... This I think goes to something, and 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 I think I'm I'm in line with you on a lot of this. Um, this this kind of comes back to an an issue that I've had for what eighteen months. I keep coming back to like it was a year and a half ago at least that I said it's time to move on from this guy. And you just you just kind of look back at the the back scratching that happens along the way, and you know people kind of saying, and and this is a thing that I know has happened on Twitter before. It's usually with Bill Meltzer about the idea that Holmgren and Clark are not telling Chuck Fletcher who to sign or who to trade for, that they are not involved in the day-to-day hockey ops. They're not. And I I have long come back to the point. They are are not. I could tell you that they are not. They're not. Let let me get one. I want to just say one thing, Russ, before you go on, because I I, was right to, to, to Clark at home. They are older guys. They spent their life in hockey, right? Bob Clark spends, I think, six months of, of the season, not even around here. Paul Holmgren lives up in Bucks County now. He golfs 95% of the days of the year when he can. They're hockey guys. It's the same thing as me. I'm a hockey guy. I love the sport. I grew up in it. You know, I played here forever. They're going to continue to go back to the office because they're lifelong flyers, especially Bob Clark. He's the greatest flyer of them all. He can walk into the office whenever the hell he wants, mm-hmm. you know, and sit in any meeting he wants. He has a right to do that. He's not telling uh, uh, Chuck who to sign. 
Clarky, if you probably named half the guys, three quarters of the guys in the league, he probably has never heard of them anyway, anymore. Same with Homer. Like, there's guys I haven't heard of anymore. If you just detach yourself, like, guys, someone's got signed the other day. I never heard the guy's name. But that happens because you're not paying attention to certain teams. They're just hockey guys. Yes, they go back a long way. And there is parts where they, they you know, they're, they are the connection, the hockey side to the top of the business side. Right? Because there's no one else in there. There's new blood. Danny's a little bit of the new blood. You know, he goes around there. But yes, there's there's a I, I think that the one part I don't want to say is a disconnect. They need to marry together more. The the two sides. They need to have somebody either somebody in the middle to moderate and mediate and make sure that like what happened last week never happens again. Ever happens again. It became a polarizing turd for everybody involved for a week unnecessary um and that can't happen again and that's that's the part where i think that there has to be some kind of a glue or somebody or something to glue the whole thing back together again and that is what people ask the loss of ed snyder that's here's your there's an example that's a perfect that's example the yeah. loss of what the, the leader at the top did taking charge and making sure that the crest the crest the flyer logo is the most important thing involved. And that, no matter what, because the business side, people in the middle, the employees, the hockey side, we're all on the same team. We're all on the same team, and we're all trying to pull the rope in different directions, or in the same direction, instead of pulling it in separate directions. And so that's really, I think, what's missing. That's, I think, part of the problem here, in a lot of ways. Um, I love Bob Clark and, and, and Homer. They were good general managers. They liked their players. They tried to put together thoughtfully the right mix of guys to make the locker room an enjoyable experience, but also have a chance to win on the ice. And Homer, you know, people say what you want. Why? Because they didn't win a Stanley Cup. I mean, Homer came a couple games away. You know, Clark, he's had a myriad of teams get the Stanley Cup finals over his term. If one team wins, I don't hear, oh, they didn't win. Oh, they didn't win. The Flyers, But the Flyers are competitive. And I think when you talk to the fan base, all they expect here is an opportunity to try to have a parade on Broad Street every year. But one, which is where, which is where I come back to the point that this is this is why it's a bigger deal, because it's one thing if a guy is saying, "Listen, Chuck, you you need to consider the the merits or lack thereof of signing Johnny Gaudreau." There, there's something to that. The problem is that these guys have a bigger impact in whispering sweet nothings into Dave Scott's ear, whether it's them directly or it's to whomever has Dave Scott's ear. Th- this this notion that Chuck Fletcher deserves more time has not been true for two years. And the longer that these guys are allowed to have influence of any kind with Dave Scott, it continues to push this team into purgatory where they've spent a decade. And I don't have the relationship that you guys have with these guys. I, I can easily sit here on the outside and say that I, I think that at this point, you know, if Paul Hungren wants to go golf, that's fine. I think that if, if this team had an owner with a backbone, they probably at this point would have lined up Clarky and Homer and and the rest, Lombardi, the whole crew, Fletcher, put them on a tee and hit them, you know, to like down the middle of the fairway. At this point, they shouldn't be here. They shouldn't have influence on ownership. They shouldn't have their their thoughts on whether Chuck Fletcher is a good GM and president of hockey ops taken into account. The the fact is, an ownership that does not understand the sport that they are in charge of. Uh, and allow themselves to be manipulated, which is what this is, into thinking that this is the correct path when the results have shown consistently for years that this is not the way to go. That's a problem. And until those guys no longer have that line of, of direct communication or have whatever sphere of influence they have, this will not get better. I just, I, I've gotten to the point now where it's great. You know, we, we can say that Clark was a good GM. We could say that Holmgren brought the team back. Those guys also didn't have to do their entire tenures with a salary cap. It was a very different league when they had their roles for a large chunk of that time. And so I, I don't I don't look at them as oracles of, of, of hockey knowledge in terms of how to build a roster and how to build a Stanley Cup contender in this NHL. And so at this point, it's just we, we, we need something to give. And it just looks like they're, they're not going to make a move at president of this team. And I cannot fundamentally understand what they're waiting for. The team went on a winning streak where they've won, you know, uh, consistently over the last few weeks. 
And so now you're not going to part with the GM because then what message does that send? They lost 10 straight games in December. That was the time to get rid of this guy. They're now entering a very likely phase where they're going to go into a trade deadline with a guy that should no longer be in charge of hockey ops, still in charge of hockey ops. They're going to enter a trade deadline where you say, all right, Ivan Provorov, we find him polarizing. Or Ivan Provorov, we don't like the, the guys that liked in the locker room. We want to move him. Or uh, Travis Konechny is having a great season. Do we consider moving him? Or, uh, you know, like Justin Braun is a reliable veteran who might, you know, be of interest to somebody going into a playoff line. You can't give Chuck Fletcher another trade deadline that directly impacts the short term as well as the potential long term in terms of assets that you would acquire. When he has proven time and time again that he is not up to the job. I just, it is so nauseating. It's so exhausting. I get sick of having to say the same thing for months and months and months. It's not getting better. And it doesn't look like they're going to make a move. Because as long as Clark and Holmgren have the ear of Dave Scott, they're not going to recommend to to get rid of, uh, uh, of Cliff Fletcher's son. Well, guess what? It should have happened by now. So, Ant, I guess, I, uh, let me throw it back to you. Like, how, how, do we, how do we make any sense of the fact that, that nothing has been done and it appears as though ownership is fine with status quo? Like, wh- what do we do? What do well, fans we do? They what, can't what, do what can can't, fans do? Like, let's, let's go there. The fans, have already, the fans have already done it. They just don't spend their money. I mean, the, the protest is we're not showing up. And we've seen that before in baseball, right, in this town. Like, it was a sh- baseball was a show me town this until mm-hmm. so, until October this past October right I mean so the, fa- the that's all the fans can do um, you know I I'm not as extreme as you Russ even though I wrote that that piece I I, I don't think that I don't think Chuck was should have been fired two years ago I think he was deserving of a of a chance to do something last last year and then didn't do it and so at that point. That's when I said, okay, you guys, are, you're right. He shouldn't have been there, but he was deserving of, a, of an opportunity because of how things kind of broke for him prior to that. Um, and I also, I mean, Paul Holmgren's entire general manager career was during a, sal- during a salary cap, his entire the entirety of it. Okay, so he turned a the worst team in hockey into a Stanley Cup contender, co- conference finalist one year, finalist another year, and another year where they should have probably been going further Um were it not for the 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 pronger eye injury, right? I mean, that would have really been the year that that team would would have had a shot. Um, so, I mean, you can't really kill Paul Holmgren's tenure. I think that he did a heck of a job considering where he came in. So, I, I I'm not as extreme as you with that. That being said, I do think we've reached a point where what is going on in today's game cannot be controlled from a from a from a perspective and a style and an ideology from even as recent as 10 years ago like the game in the last decade has changed a lot and the way teams operate has changed a lot and i have not seen that change be adapted by the flyers i mean everybody's going to talk about say it's analytical and the flyers have built an analytics department so i don't think it has to do with analytics I, I just think it's the, that the way that the, the way that the the teams are put together now, the Flyers are not that because they don't have they have not been afforded the opportunity until maybe Cotter Gauthier and we'll see what he looks like when he gets a, a an NHL sweater on next year. They really haven't been given the opportunity to to put those kind of star players on the ice from their own drafts. We we were kind of bamboozled a little bit with Hextall's drafts, right? Yeah. Dude, we were told all these guys were going to come in and they were going to be star players. Just wait for Ivan Provorov and Travis Sandheim to come in and be like these great defensemen. And then you're going to have Nolan Patrick and Hermann Rupsov. And, you know, they, these guys have not panned out. Hextall had some good picks, Car- yeah, they, that, that have become good players yeah. um, later on in the, in the in the draft, but none of them were stars. They haven't drafted a star play. What was the who was the last star quality player that was drafted? I mean, you could TK who? TK. That's what I mean. TK's happened. It took him seven years, right? But but that's what I'm saying. Like, but is he like is he 
Is he a superstar? Like no, he's not. He's not. No, but but I, I'm just saying it from a developmental standpoint. But you're right. right. The one thing Hextall, I will say this about Hextall's right. Like, I like I played with Hex. He's a he's a friend. But man, there was a lot of bullshit that came out of that regime too. Oh, yeah. the kids are coming. The kids are coming. The kids are coming. They're just gonna the kids were okay. They're no better than anyone else's kids, and they were in fact they weren't as good as a lot of other teams' kids. And by the way, by the time Hextall brought his kids here, everybody else's kids were already playing two years in the NHL. Right. There is a question though about like it, does any of that fall on developmental? You know, like and 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 look, yeah. I know it's hard. It, it it is very hard. And I think we talked about this at the beginning of the year, uh, about Cam York now making the, the opening roster. I feel like we what we dove into this a little bit. It it is hard without being there, without being in the locker room, in the meetings, to to be able to discern who it really falls on. Is it that the the talent or the the expectation of what the talent would be was over was inflated, right? Or does some of it fall on the lack of cohesive development over time? And like there are a few circumstances here that like are are variables you can't control for, right? Like this team has had turnover at the head coaching position which means that they've also had turnover at the AHL level in terms of assistance as well as the the head coach of the Phantoms. Um, you, you've had a regime change between Hextall and Fletcher. All of those things can kind of throw an organization into disarray. And it does make me wonder sometimes, you know, like you, you see what a competent coach in Tortorella can do for Konechny. And then you say, all right, well, if, if Konechny had had this for the last two or three years, is he the same player over time? Is he an even better version of himself? From what we see now, do, do we see a better uh, Ivan Provrov who doesn't feel the need to be, you know, overutilized in all situations? And like, do they allow him to develop properly instead of kind of throwing him into the fire from the get go? Do we see a Travis San uh, Sanheim who learns to play a more physical brand of hockey and perhaps doesn't shy away from contact? Do we see a bunch of these players that were brought up that were supposed to have all this upside? Do we see them have better fundamentals? Do we see them? Uh, play a more consistent brand of hockey for what this organization wants to see. And it's impossible to know. But I I think that we'd be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge that that is a possibility. And that perhaps all of the turnover and perhaps issues in the development of these players as they've come up through the organization has also inhibited some of their growth. Maybe Hextall was a mediocre drafter. Maybe he was slightly above average. Maybe he was below average. It really is hard to know. I think we'll have a better idea of it in another year or maybe two years if these guys are still here with John Schwarterella as their coach. The returns on Konechny have been have been impressive. They have been, I think, better than we expected. And actually, that, I think, is a good time for us to dive into this topic because it's something that has gone on. I know Charlie O'Connor wrote about this for The Athletic, but you're in a position where, Bundy, this comes back to something you said earlier in the episode. Team needs a number one defenseman. Team needs high-end talent. They need top-end talent. Team's not close to competing this year or next year, maybe even the year after. You look at a guy like Travis Konechny who's having a career season, a guy who, with a legitimate coach in John Tortorella, has had this massive resurgence, looks like the player that I think a lot of people thought we were going to be getting. It does beg the question, is it worth having Travis Konechny be here to be like this version of Cam Atkinson, right? The, the, the Philadelphia equivalent of what Atkinson was to Tortorella in Columbus. Or do you try to sell high on Travis Konechny at the trade deadline yeah. and, and get future assets? Where do you fall on it, Bundy? Because you've, you've lived the life of the player. You've been able to let, you know, you've set locker rooms. Some are contenders, some aren't. How do you feel as a player if you see a guy like Konechny get traded? Like, where where is your head at? Yeah. I, I move, I'm, if I'm the GM, I'm looking to move him. It's the same thing as Vancouver. He's a Bo Horvat type of player. He actually is Bo Horvat's cousin, too, ironically. Uh, he um, He's a guy that, like, I like him. But if you're on a really good team, he's not your top-line guy. Right? So if you got him at a position right now where people are going to be like, hey, he's playing really well. He could help our team in the playoffs. You have to trade the asset. Because they're going to give you a lot more back than probably what he's worth, especially if you could recircle it and end up getting like a number one or, or, or a first-round pick that maybe needs development and it's not need time for the NHL yet. I don't know what he's going to get. That's the other problem is what is team, what are teams going to give away? But yeah, I mean, I, like I said, Russ, I didn't, I wasn't hesitant at all. 
I said, I don't think there's one safe guy here. Like one guy that you can't say is absolutely completely should be safe. Um, because you are a moving part right now. The whole team's a moving part until you circle back again. And again, there's so many parts. Like who's making those moves? Is it Chuck? Is it someone else? You know what I mean? Again, so, but for me, if I'm the GM, if someone said to me, if I, you need to come in and run this team, I'm going to have a pretty good idea of what I'd want it. Uh, I'm sorry. I have a good idea of what I'd like. Whoa. Wait a second. Hold on. Pause. I just saw that little glint in your eye. That looked like, a, all right, so Bunny's got an idea of, uh, you know, what he would do with the team. So well, I, I do. I do know. I do know what I would do with the team. I mean, there's a, there's a new look to what you have to do. And you said it. There's a, the game's evolved in 10 years. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the brood of the past is gone. But there's also, there's, but there's still room for that. You know, there's still room for some of it to make your team feel, you know, comfortable to make your you know your fans engage on a nightly basis. It can't be the overhauling premise of what your team is. You're not going to win. But, I mean, those are things I'm just saying in my head, whether they'd be right or wrong. I'm not saying they'd be right. I said I'd have a vision of what I'd like to do. Um, but, again, there's so much, like I said, Russ, there's so many moving parts. But you're asking me right now if there's one safe guy or is there one guy that I wouldn't consider? No. Because you need to turn this around, and the only way to turn it around to make it different is to get rid of the stuff you have here to begin with. Whether it's good, bad, ugly, great, whatever you think it is, the person running it, you have got to tear down what's broken to rebuild it. And that's that's the fact. That's a reality. Yeah, and, and I think I think Bundy's right on with that. Obviously, there's players you have to get a little bit more for, right? I mean, you're not moving them unless you get a good return. And that's your Konechny's. That's Carter Hart. That's probably even Ivan Provorov. To be honest with you, there, yeah, you know, what I'm saying you're you want to get a return for him. Um, uh, maybe even maybe even Sandheim, just because sure. of what you've got invested in him, right? Yeah. Um, but then there's the next tier down, right? And then there's guys who say, okay, look, we can get out from some salary, and and you know that is that is affecting us. And if even if we don't get a great return for him, the cap savings is is the return. And I think that that includes a guy like Tony D'Angelo at this point, even though it's only one more year. Like teams will take his talent on. Somebody will want say if you made him available, some teams will go, Oh yeah, I'll take Tony D'Angelo for the playoff push. You can put him in a power play. Yeah. Play well twelve minutes a night in the third pair or play him on the power play if you're yeah. a dynamo team. Yeah. You can't play five off five on a good, really good playoff team. Right. That would be a problem. Right. Is there a problem with that though? Like and and I don't mean to interrupt and I'll throw it right back to you, but isn't that part of the problem if Chuck Fletcher is the guy who's in charge of it though? Because that was one of his big off season acquisitions. Like you would think that if, if you're going to be willing to move on from a guy that you've either traded for or you've extended that the guy who was the one who actually made the acquisition in the first place or the extension probably shouldn't be the one to make the move. Be, or honestly, he might not thousand, even be willing to make that. A thousand percent, Russ. But that's, but, you know, in lieu of that change happening, which we're all surprised it's not happened yet, right? We're all kind of surprised that this is where we're at. In lieu of that happening, you you got to kind of say, okay, well, regardless of who's making the decision, here's what the, you have, here's what they should do, and then you hope that, cross your fingers, you know, that if that in fact is going to be happen, that this is what he would do or try to get in return. I, you know, but I could also, I, I'm really, I I'm compelled to see how this breaks down because it's they are twelve games away. Uh, from the trade deadline, right? Um, and, and where they're at after those 12 games will, to me, dictate a lot of whether he's selling off a lot, selling off a little, or not selling off at all. I don't think he's a buyer. I don't ever think he's a buyer, even if they're still, you know, four points out of a playoff spot or something. I still don't think he's a buyer. But I can see that if that's the case that they're in, Maybe it's a stand pat kind of thing, which is also wrong, which would also be the wrong thing to do, right? The stand standing, pat, standing pat. You have to try and get something. You have to start trying to accumulate futures, future assets for this organization. And and if you stand pat and just wait till the summer, well, that's another yet another wasted opportunity that goes by that kicks the can just a little further down the road. Does does only selling off ancillary pieces count as standing pat? So like if it like I mentioned before, like a Justin Braun who like some yeah, some that, teams might want to get some teams might want yeah, the that, idea of having Braun because he's a he's yeah, a good that one doesn't move, that like one doesn't that. move that one doesn't move the needle. I don't disagree, but 
you know, if, if from the optics standpoint, right, if you're arguing that like, well, you know, Chuck, Chuck traded away Justin Braun, you know, he didn't stand Pat or like that's yeah, the narrative no, that gets that's, spun. That, that, that doesn't count, right? You're talking that's, about selling, well, selling off like a, a piece of, of, of value, whether it's a well, D'Angelo or. Well, let's put it this way, right? Justin Braun is not impacting your salary cap, right? And what are you getting for Justin Braun? I mean, the fact that they got a third round pick last year for him was to me a, a huge win. I thought it was a good trade, right? Um, at this point, if you get a fifth, sixth round pick for Justin Braun, you take it, okay? Um, so, no, that one doesn't move the needle. Y you need to start. I don't care what the trade is. The trade has to net you something. And when I say net you something, it has to net you valuable future. So either good draft picks or a prospect of some kind, like a legit prospect, not just some, you know, hackney minor leaguer who's never going to come close to making it to the NHL. Right. Um, or it's got to get you salary cap relief right those are those are benefits those are assets those are futures those are things that help the team down the road so those kinds of trades i look at and i would say okay that's not standing pat if by trading jb um not jbr kevin hayes for example let's say you could get kevin hayes out let's just just say somebody says that they want him okay and even if you are eating some of the salary if you're able to alleviate five million dollars off of your cap let's just say that's a that's a win that's a say that's a win that's not standing pat right i mean so there are things that can be done to you know without accruing actual picks or players that could be viewed as positive for the organization moving forward but standing pat is basically doing nothing or just trading away from the fringes like again jvr i i, I forty and slipped there when i said his name but it, let's just say you trade him, but you don't get anything really in return. Like, what good? Like, is that moving the needle either? No, it's really not. No, I, I argue it does because it it goes back to something that we've all agreed on before, which is that's a roster spot that's currently being held by a diminished yet still competent NHL player. And to the point of, you can't ask players to tank, and you certainly can't ask Jordan Tortorella to tank. That is a spot that could potentially be filled by a lower level player or by an AHL player where either you're one looking to get meaningful ice time or two. Okay. You're, I, you're, I, I, but I'm going to stop. I mean? I'm going to stop. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And if we were having this conversation a month ago, I would be on board with you. But here's where I'm going to stop you. Because just as we sit here and say the Flyers are eight points out of a playoff spot right now with 32 games to go, and that's next to impossible to make up in that period of time considering you have to play, a, you know, 16 of their last 32 games are against current playoff teams. So, I mean, you would have to you would have to turn around your winning percentage against those 16 teams versus what you've already done this year, like, exponentially. You would have to play at least as well against the non-playoff teams as you've played so far, if not a little bit better. And a bunch of teams in front of you would have to start losing in the process. So you, making up that eight points is next to impossible. Just as much falling down the standings that far is is just as hard like they're the flyers are not going to be they may slide a little bit they're the ninth worst team in hockey right now they could maybe get to six seven right but i don't i don't see them getting into the top five because those it's not like those teams are suddenly going to get exponentially better yes the flyers might lose more but they've put so much of a cushion between themselves and the bottom of the standings that those teams that are at the bottom aren't going to win enough to catch up. So that so that's my point. It's like you're right, Russ. If this was a month ago, and they were a little bit closer to the bottom, and you were talking about moving a, a veteran player out and bringing in an AHL caliber player to replace him and have that impact your team's chances of winning, then absolutely that would have been a good thing. I think you just get to the point now where if you're if you do that, you can try basically to start sliding down the standings but the odds are of getting low enough are are much worse now than they would than they were a month ago which all comes back to the the shame of it is that the organization didn't have the correct vision entering the season because you could have earlier in the season this is where i come back to like if you had made the change in the off season decent chance that a new gm comes in and in november looks at the season Travis Konechny's having, looks at the season Kevin Hayes is having, looks at what Ivan Provorov is and says, 
now's the time to sell off before we pick up so many extra wins or so many extra points with this coach that we put ourselves in the position to be the ninth worst team, and the 10th worst team in hockey come January. So, um, guys, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to get to today. We have a five star. We have five stars, Russ. I believe we do. It's interesting too because, as people who listen to the show now, um, it's it's interesting. Some people follow the instructions. A very simple instruction. You can you can uh, leave a nice review. You can trash us. Whatever. It has to be a five star review. If it's less than five star review, we don't read it on the show. Um. I think we had one. It might have been two. Maybe it was three. Uh, I, th- I, think I, I think I saw two, but maybe there was a third one that I missed. Oh no! I no, I've got it. We're, it's more than that. All right. So, um, and actually, one of them I think is one that Bundy wanted to address. So we'll go there. So the first one is from R two R S eighty eight. Says sad five stars. Really lost respect for all these guys when it came to the LGBTQ night, especially Chris. One-sided view and talks very arrogant and says a lot about what type of men these guys. Are. That's a lie. That's a lie, Bundy. So I, I know you wanted to address it, Bundy. I'll let you go first, and then I follow up. I just wanted to go by. I don't want to ha- hamper on it too much. And I think what happened was is it just became to me. I looked at it from the player standpoint last week. So here's first. This, this I, I don't want to ha- I don't want to hack on it too long because I, it's it was just one of the most polarizing things. Um, again, yeah, you could do whatever you want. But here's my issue. It led up to a week before, and I guess there was discussions about it. If you have two guys on your team, and they support something, and they put time into it, and the only effort that was asked of you was to put on a jersey that was emblematic and not in a in a, in a kind of a pro like nobody asked anybody to drive down and go to a pride parade or walked front and center holding the pride flag. No one did that. So for me, as a guy who loved his teammates and and valued the importance of making them comfortable, whether I believe... Ivan Provrov had a right to do what he did. But to me, when I said it was a bigger part of it, I was looking at it strictly from the player standpoint, and I don't think I got that across well enough last week. Yes, there's a moving world, and you can believe whatever you want. But just for me, so people understood it better, it was about having support for the other teammates on that team that were involved in that night. Clearly, they have gay relatives. I don't have to be a rocket science to figure that out. and Or they have somebody very close to them that they support the Pride Night. For me, I've been like, whatever. Whether I believe in that or not, or don't, or do, or whatever, I'm putting the jersey on because... It's just about my team. teammates, and it's about not making it a polarizing moment. Great, you sold your jersey out. Like, it's that whatever. I'd looked at it only about the 20 guys in that locker room that night, and I'm going to say this, too. I've never in my life ever heard of a player sitting a warm-up out, warm up out and then coming back and playing. That, to me, was unbelievable. Like, if you if you're, if you got enough conviction to believe what you're doing, Put your regular jersey on and go out and skate around with your team for warm-ups. You know? That's it. You said it last week, but the more I thought about it, I'm looking from the player standpoint. The whole thing, I think, was handled really poorly, which is what we talked about, that the glue between the hockey and the business side a little bit. But me, I don't care what the person did. You can do what you want. Whether people believe it's right or wrong, and anybody that knows me, <laughs> people that know me, know me. And uh, they know what I stand for when I believe it. But you know what? From my from my standpoint, guys, I choose. I would have chosen to be a good teammate and to do the right thing for my teammate, not for anybody else. No matter what your beliefs are. Again, you know he didn't have to say one word about Pride Night. No one asked him to comment on it. No one asked him to make a comment about gay marriage, whether your beliefs. No one cared. No one cared. Pull a jersey on for 50 minutes. That was I was saying. And that sometimes is the is being the better guy and the be, and the respected teammate that can do that. So I hope I clarified it. it had nothing to do with politics. Um, you know, I just that's just the way I felt. And 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 to be honest with you, um, I'll say this: I played in this town a long time, and I think if I was a shit teammate, I wouldn't have been here very long with a guy like Bob Clark running the team. So I always felt I knew it was the right thing as a player and a teammate, and and that's just the way it is. Outside of that. Ivan, do whatever, do whatever you want to do. But my point was, my frustration was, 
I was trying to enunciate and, and point out the, the team part of it. Nothing else, just a member of the hockey team dealing with that situation and why it would have been easier to just do that. Be like, oh, easier. It's harder to not do. It. It's not. It doesn't mean you're advocating for anything. It just means you put the jersey on, you take it off after warm up anyway, and then you put on your your regular jersey to go. I just don't think it, it was worth the polarization um, that was had that was handed down to the guys that were involved in it, uh, to to the business side, to the hockey side, to everybody, including guys like ourselves that had to talk about it. It pisses me off. Anyway, five stars. Thanks for the five stars. Sorry you didn't like it, but I hope that that put a little bit of understanding into it. If nothing to do with the person, the politician, the political views, it was just a team thing. And I thought from that standpoint, the right thing to do would be to recognize um, other people's efforts in it. And and because if no one says a word about it, right, no one's talking about it after, you know, yeah. you just go on. Yeah. All right. And, so, and, and, and then just for, just on our behalf, Russ, since, I mean, yeah. I mean, I know that I know it was directed primarily at Bundy, but it did say very arrogant and says a lot about what type of men these guys are. So it's referencing you and me as well. Uh, the one thing I will point out is we did say on the episode last week, and I will reiterate again right now, that lost in this in the hysteria around Provorov not wearing the jersey and people politicizing that aspect of it was all the good that came from that night in that arena. Like there was so much good that happened and we should have been celebrating that. We should have been talking about that. We said that last week. So, so to sit there and suggest that we are one sided on this and that maybe we all took a political angle to it. We did not. We did not. Pride night was a great night down at the flyers. What Scott Lawton and James Van Reems like especially did was great to hear them talk about it after the game was was awesome we talked about that last last week we said it on the show that doesn't necessarily but we were addressing the one situation that was brought up by ivan provorov not the entirety of the evening so therefore that's why i just wanted to clarify for our perspectives because i think i think it's fair to say all three of us were perfectly happy to see pride night happen Happy to see that they had a good turnout for it. Happy that everything went really well for the organization from that perspective. I don't think that any of us are sitting here saying, oh, that's a stupid thing. We should have done that. Blah, blah, blah. We stand with Provorov. None of us. Those words never came out of any of our mouths. So this I just wanted so to much, clarify so that. Much more than I and again, so nobody, much nobody asked him to do anything. Uh, that was yeah. just play more and put the jersey. Nobody asked him to be uh, like an advocate or an activist or anything. I mean, it just, nobody did. And, and believe uh, me, I mean, he did. You could tell him to go fucking pound sand. You can't. Let me just say really, oh, that gets to our next five-star review. Um, I, just really quick. I want to point out, and th call this an unpopular take, I think Pro is the best thing to happen to Pride Night. Because had it not been for the controversy, it would have just been another night. It would have gone down as like another night that's special for a community that they're celebrating but would have largely gone unnoticed by the general public, right? The same way that, and I don't want to start calling out different nights. Like we have, and they're not really comparable, but like hockey, hockey fights, cancer night. Like that's a, a really big deal. You have like some of the, the nights that they set up for like different groups of people. And there's like different, you know, uh, ethnic groups and everything that they set up. And it's not just at the, the flyers, they do for the Phillies and everything. Otherwise it probably just becomes a night. I don't know. Maybe the controversy ends up, you know, causing, I'm sure, you know, it gets a lot of people out who, uh, are not thrilled uh, about what Pride Night is. And then on the other side, you get a bunch of people who are like, you know what, this is actually, yeah, you start a conversation. I don't know. Next five serve, you actually goes to what Bunny just said, uh, a certain word he chose. Best Flyers podcast from David2522, who says, uh, happy Bundy was added to the podcast, but can no longer listen to it with the grandkids in the car. I do feel like <laughs> Bundy is the one who brought the profanity to the show. And now we've and all fallen into it. I will also point. I'm pretty no, sure we did not write back. That's, we those are not those words. I'm reading it along with you. I'm like, he did not say that Bundy brought the profanity. No, 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 that was me. I'm sorry. Oh, I had a three three last week, and I am sorry about that. But I was pissed off, and and I didn't swear this week until I just said that pissed off. But you know what? I it just kind of goes with the flow. I mean, there's nothing like a good f bomb sometimes in there, you know, mixing it in. So that's 
That's what I did. That's what you need. To, that's what the uh, the the reviewer needs to tell their grandkids. There's nothing quite like a good f bomb. Uh, Flyer fan sixteen says, "Where's this going?" Five stars. First off, love the show. Most plugged in guys on the team. My question is: ten of the last eleven Stanley Cup champions have had a first or second overall pick that they drafted on their team. All except the Blues, who still had um, uh, Petro. They took fourth overall. Does that mean bottoming out, especially in a hard cap league, is the best way to build a champion? And assuming that's true, what's the point of following this team anymore considering they're choosing the, the road less traveled to get to the promised land? That's a great question. I think we touched on it. but We, we already talked about it, and again, we, we spent 20 minutes talking about it. The answer is there in the show. Yep. Uh, and then I think, let's see, there's one star reviews. Sad, you should have left a five star. We would have read it. Uh, last one, Totoro. Uh, five stars, two parter, uh, one for Russ and all of you. Um, let's see. He said that I was a cold dude for tweeting at Broad Street Hockey with the classic firing line, which I guess we have to talk about. Uh, we wish you the best in your future endeavors. You still got the Niners winning the NFC. Do you think Purdy is going to outplay Jalen Hurts and the Eagles in Philly? They barely beat Dallas. Go birds spelled with a U. Um, yeah, it wasn't the intent there. Uh, we said we're not going to really address this. I will say really quickly, Broad Street Hockey, I know they are they have a GoFundMe going right now. They're trying to buy the domain for their site, I, I believe, from Vox. I don't know what's happening to their podcast. We put out a thing. Uh, if, if you happen to be on Twitter, you saw Crossing Broad did something. That was not us. We did not control the account. We cannot control the editorial side of things over on that site. But what we did do was put out our own thing, which actually Bundy, I believe, promoted on Facebook. You know, you don't want to see people lose their livelihoods. You don't want to see people lose their outlet. So it looks like they are trying actively to acquire the site or to acquire their podcast feed or whatever from the company that's essentially laying them all off. We wish them the best. Um, that that all their trades are endeavors. Yeah, we don't want to see anybody lose their their job. It does. Sound, I will say one thing really quickly. It does sound like a lot of the people who had been writing for the site across all of those sites, those SB Nation sites. We're getting wildly underpaid. Um, like $12 an article is not uh, much money at all. It is not a, a good thing. I know that they unionized at one point. I genuinely don't understand how a, a union doesn't have the ability to institute a, a higher fee, I guess, per post. I'm not saying that's a Philly market specific issue, just in general. Um, we do wish those people the best. I'm sure they're going to figure it out if they aren't able to get their site i'm sure they'll start something else up there are good people who have written for that site in the past who probably you know probably some that's still right yeah. for it now charlie o'connor comes to mind he started at that site and he spun that off into being one of the the best people on the beat now for the athletics so we do wish them all the best um sure. that's about all we can i think that's i think that's all we can do on our side is express again publicly as we did on twitter we don't want to see people lose their jobs we don't revel in it. We are not dancing on anyone's grave. And by the way, I think they're all going to be fine. And honestly, the way that you can monetize an audience, I'm guessing that if they do it the right way, they're going to be able to make more money, not under that umbrella than they did in the first place. So can I, say, so best I, lost, I lost yeah. my hockey job a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm work for you guys in the brotherhood that we shared here. I've had an opportunity to voice my hockey knowledge and share my insights as a former player. You right. can rebuild yourself. Just remember that, kids. And that's all I got. That's right. That's right. He did. Oh, let's see if and, and just, just so it doesn't sound like I'm avoiding this, I, I just want to say I second everything you guys have said. I, I, without, I mean, there's no reason to continue to reiterate it. But yes, we, I, I, I wish them all the best and hope to see them stay in. Yep. Uh, be, being able to to write and talk about the sport that they are very passionate about. Yes. And hope that they are have the ability to continue to do that for as long as they want to do it. There we go. What's that on a positive note, guys? I love that. A little bit of positivity to end the podcast today. So uh, I think that's it. So you can make sure uh, you subscribe to the show. There are a few different ways to do it. And I, 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 I've been failing to do this, but you can hit the, the bell button or whatever to subscribe or get the notification when a new episode drops on the podcast or on the, uh, the YouTube channel. Um, you can follow the podcast on any podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, wherever you get your podcasts, just find Snow the Goalie, hit subscribe, or if you're on Spotify, hit follow. It'll populate your podcast feed. I've, 
I've gone back and forth with a few people in DMs who don't understand podcast apps, but I've helped them get set up so they don't have to just look out for the post on Crossing Broad when it goes up. So uh, just make sure you uh, follow. And as we've been asking for a few weeks now, and, and we're seeing it, so it's kind of cool. Uh, tell two people, two Flyers fans in your life about so the goalie, let them know. Uh, they can watch it on YouTube. They can listen to it on podcast speed. They can talk to their smart device at home if they've got a Google Home or or an Amazon Echo device. You can request it to, to play the latest episode of So the Goalie Flyers podcast. You can do that through uh, hands-free with your, your phone, your Android, or your iPhone through Google or Siri. So uh, I probably just set off like 40 different devices in my own house by saying that. Uh, a big thank you for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Ant, uh, at Ant San Philly, at Cetarian6, at Joy on Broad, at Snow the Goalie. All of those also continue over on Instagram and then Facebook.com slash Snow the Goalie. Ant's got his finger in the air. By the way, Ant, thank you for getting out of the car, plugging in your mic uh, about 20 minutes into the episode. We do appreciate it. Your audio quality is exponentially better. Far less editing for me to do at the end. What do you have to say? Well, I didn't ans answer Totoro's question. Okay. Yes, I do think the 49ers are going to beat the Eagles on Sunday. Why? We had a positive end. Okay, hold on. I had a good point. They're the only team that can beat the Eagles on Sunday. They were the okay. only team. Do I yeah. think the Eagles can win? Absolutely. So oh, they can win. Sure. Dallas could not come here and win. They were right. not going to win. No chance. The only team who has a chance to come here and win is unfortunately the Niners. Yes, yeah. they are. They are. We'll see. And I think it's a close game, uh, and I think it could go either way. But if I had to pick a side, I'm going to pick San Francisco. Right. Let's point out the fact the Phillies made the World Series lost on the same day the Philadelphia Union lost the MLS Cup in a penalty shootout. It would only be fitting for the Philadelphia brand for the Eagles to make the Super Bowl and lose. But I have a good feeling about this team. I genuinely do. I think it's going to be okay. Whoever wins the game. NFC game wins the Super Bowl. I'm going to say no. I like that. I like that. The NFC but and, and you agree with that? I, yeah, that I don't I'm even think it's I don't think it's even going to be a problem to win. I think whoever plays oh. the AFC wins the game. I, I kind of agree. I, I, Cincinnati scares me a little bit just because of the way they're going. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just don't, I don't like Kansas City's defense, and with Mahomes being banged up, I don't think they're going to win that game. Um, I think Cincinnati can play with these with both these teams. I just think both the Eagles and the 49ers are better than both Kansas City and Cincinnati. So yes, I would I would agree with Bundy on this on that call. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Burrow's really good. Right. He's, yeah. he's like he is, he's cool as a cucumber too. He's scary. He's a scary dude. Like he. He's yeah. too cool for a guy that age. He's not young, yeah. but 30 and behind the ice is dead. He's yeah. a real deal. He's yeah, he's he's real. All right. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening to Snow the Goalie, and uh we will talk to all of you next week.